Um, great, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I should say we've just, um, in, in relation to the point that was just made about the decline in influenza. Um, uptake across Europe since 2008. What, of course, has happened since 2008 is not just the growth of computers, but, of course, austerity. And we, we ILC UK published a report with the, uh, uh, from an unrestricted educational grant from Pfizer last week that showed that actually austerity across Europe has correlated with declines in uptake of flu across Europe, flu vaccination uptake across Europe. So, so the, the, of course, we don't know what the impact of that will be in terms of health yet, it's certainly more but, but actually there is, and I think we shouldn't be too, yeah, so there is, you know, we shouldn't forget austerity, we shouldn't be too down on social media, you know, let's not forget in the UK, one photo of a child with meningitis, you know, led to huge change, you know, actually, there, you know, technology can be a force for good, I think. Um, I, um, uh, my conflict of interest, we've had a couple of unrestricted educational grants from Pfizer. I'm also get, we get some funding from charities, from insurance companies, from all sorts of ethical organisations. Um, I, we all have biases, I have bias, you have to make a decision about how biased I'm being. My job is to try and understand consensus science and then decide what I think. Um, so, I, I work for a research-based organisation that looks at, looks at ageing, we look at public policy, we, we, we are present across the world, we have 17 ILCs in, 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 different, in, in different countries, um, one based in Columbia University for example, we've got one in Brazil. Um, so we have pretty broad coverage and we in ILC UK certainly cover a, a very wide range of issues. Last week we had a session on AMR and vaccination at our conference where we were taught how to wipe our bum and what to do after having sex in order to reduce the risk of infections by one doctor. But we also had a, a guy from Pfizer, Paul Vanderbrook, talking about driverless cars. So we do everything from sex to driverless cars. Um, not at the same time. Not at the same time. Uh, I had very quickly. Uh, I, I found myself on, on national television at one point justifying why older people should listen to One Direction and on another occasion why we should have swings at bus stops. Um, so so we we're pretty broad in what we cover. Uh, and, and we as ILC Global Alliance and ILC UK have done a lot of work over as you know, the last ten years on 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 adult immunisation, and um, I'll cu I'll come back to that. We most recently did a little piece of work on on AMR and adult vaccination, and we're currently hosting a website. But I'll come back to that. We were one of the founding members of a European initiative that published a report in 2013 on um, on adult immunisation. Um, and in fact, we uh, yeah, th there were three or four reports that came as part of that. There was a cost effectiveness, there was a burden of disease, and we led on on some of the work in relation to healthy aging policies. Um, so, so, so to big area first, uh, does anyone speak Japanese here? Or is anyone from Japan? No, no, that's good. Because if this is wrong, you won't know. Um, so basically, this is what this is what you get given on your hundredth birthday in Japan, or or you did get given on your hundredth birthday in Japan up until about 10 years ago. About eight years ago, the Japanese government decided there were so many people who were over 100 that they had to reduce the diameter of it by a centimetre to save money. Um, they've just announced that actually they're, they're pretty much, you're not going to get this anymore. So you've got to get to 100 in Japan pretty quickly. I just think that's a more interesting example than the demographic chart. You know. Actually, what we've got is, it, and we heard yesterday, a big growth in the both developed and developing world of the oldest old, the 75, 85 plus. It's not just a growth in the, in the 60, 65 plus. Um, there is, of course, a lot of interest in, in healthy ageing. This is me at one of my, my local runs. I, have to, I am one of these slightly obsessed people who tracks like how far I run and how much I run. And there is a, a huge... Garmin will make a lot of money this Christmas from people selling, buying these products. Um, we, and we've got this story of healthy ageing that is, you know, people are interested in this, aren't they? Except, of course, you know, 
actually big bits of it are nonsense. You know, the reality is physical activity participation continues to fall. You know, these images, which are the worst images on the, in the world, and I have to say the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance industry are amongst the worst for these. You know, firstly, the image of the, the, the four people jogging. Does anyone know anyone who goes jogging in their jeans? Um, uh, you know, secondly, the, the one on the far right, I don't know a single woman who would put a basket on wet sand. And, and yet what we're doing is selling this story of active ageing, which is, it's nonsense. It doesn't exist. Um, we have, you know, coming back to this, the, the point that was made earlier about the need for evidence. In the UK, we had an initiative that was politically led of free swimming. The evaluation said essentially what happens with giving free swimming to older people is the same people tend to go and they go a little bit more often. And the, the, the barriers to swimming isn't cost, but politically it's a very convenient thing for people to, to offer. I think we've got a thing with, you know, with, um, with public health where actually we're afraid of some of the big challenges and we're, it, p politicians find it very difficult. But 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 there is interest, you know, there is undoubtedly interest in, in healthy ageing. In 2015, I mentioned it in the bio, five million people in the UK had an active subscription to a gym. And yet, actually, very few of them will pay 10 euros in Sainsbury's for a, a, a flu jab. Um, so, so, you know, we've got on the one hand this story of people being very interested, but on the other hand, actually, a bit of a reluctance. I, I won't go through this because, you know, this is IPD and age, and clearly we've already heard some of the biggest burden fall out, falls at young age, and then at the bottom it's, um, it's flu, and then in old age. Um, interestingly, of course, you do see a drop um, in, and I think one is mortality and one is case at the bottom right in terms of flu. And of course, that could be attributed to the success of flu vaccination, actually, that what you see, you're seeing here, the drop in uh, as we get older, is, is partly a success story. Um, so we know immunisation has got a good story to say. We, we know that there is cost effectiveness evidence, although again, and this is one that's very diff a message that's very difficult to get across in certain audiences, is that actually the cost effectiveness of, of adult immunisation is a really hard, it's very hard to make that case because actually, uh, you know, publicly politicians will say, of course, we understand the cost effectiveness uh, arguments. Um, but what Treasury ministers know is if we live a little bit longer, it costs more. So, and you die of dementia and cancer instead of another disease. So there is a very big risk that actually, you know, if you're not vaccinated, if, if vaccination does not keep you in the workplace longer, the cost effectiveness evidence is not as strong as it would be for vaccinating people in their 50s. And one of the problems is that Treasury ministers need this, but no, this but they will never publicly talk about this it will never you know we so actually cost effectiveness as loan and why i think we've got to move more towards the value of vaccination the broader value including the value in terms of carers you know actually older people aren't just working they're caring for other people and and vaccination has a huge role in in a much broader picture of course, cost effectiveness is the big game we play anyway in terms of getting drugs on the market but but i think there are weaknesses of it um uh, we've heard about this, so I won't say very much. Um, AMR adds a sense of urgency, as indeed does climate change. You know, the risk, and we heard about so, some of the issues with animals before. Similarly, migration. I haven't heard anyone talk about migration, but m uh, global migration adds to the, the risk of the spread of disease. Um, and as we've also seen, you see very significant variation. This is flu in, in uptake in, in adults. This was from the SARTI report, so a little dated. Um, um, but actually, I will build on and agree on the final point. If, if actually there is uh, um, a sense of, if there are different recommendations in different countries, I think it undermines the science of vaccination. And you see that in places like Germany, where if you have a different vaccination in one lander to another, and I live in this area and I get something and I don't, and I get something else, actually, if I'm a member of the public, I would look at that and think, do you scientists not know what you're, t you know, I, actually I think there has got to be something, we've got to make sure that we have a degree of consistency of messaging. Um, but actually, you know, it, perhaps we don't need to wor worry because all the consumers are really well informed, aren't they? Really well engaged. You have stories like this, fewer ties to family responsibilities. This is, this is huge in the UK. I don't know if it's everywhere. Everyone's obsessed with baby boomers being different as though 
our eyesight doesn't go in our hearing, that there's this complete denial of ageing in the baby boomers sector, and it's this, it's they've got lots of money, they don't need to worry about it. Of course, this was written in 1962. For more than 50 years, we've been pretending baby boomers won't get ill um, and won't have these sorts of challenges, and the reality is they, they will, and we can't assume that ageing won't affect us. And I think part of the problem is the denial of ageing means that very few of us want to prevent it because we don't think it's going to happen to us. Um, you see that with debates around care homes. Everyone says they're never going into a care home, even if a third of us might die in a care home. You know, the reality is we deny ageing, and I don't think it's helpful for this agenda. So, so what do we need to do? And I'm going to run through these quickly. These are some of the things I think we should be focusing on. Actually, I think we do need to work a bit more on how we inform and engage older consumers, whether that be through carers. In the UK, we have this, as children, we have this red book where you record all of your immunisation status. Um, we sort of get, forget about it when we get to 16 and never worry about it ever again. And then you find it when you're getting into your 60s in a cupboard somewhere. Um, but actually, the point earlier about tetanus, you know, actually people don't remember whether they've had once every 10 years or whether they've had five across their lifetime, because why would you? you know, it, so, so you know, perhaps we need a slip of paper in the passport. We certainly need a better way of, of recording across our life what vaccinations we've got. We actually need to use, you know, can we use travel vaccination clinics and health checks, as, as was mentioned earlier, to inform adults about, uh, about vaccination? People will, if they're going abroad, you know, go and get their, their vaccination for, um, you know, their travel vaccination. Can, can we use some of those? So I think there's, there's got, and, and actually this question that it's in some ways easier in the UK than other places, but it's actually not easy to find out what the guidelines are in some places. If you're a consumer, it can be quite difficult to know whether you're eligible for in some places. Um, I think, and this is a, what we've also got to do as part of that is is a, a really interesting initiative by the nurses in in the UK, but uh, uh, which is called Make Every Contact Matter. And the idea is that if you go into a hospital in a healthcare setting, you know for. Uh, a fracture or whatever, the idea is that you're also asked about your immunisation status. And I think actually trying to do that is really important. This is a, an initiative, I think, for some GP, from some GPs, roll up, get your flu vaccine, and while you're at it, get your pneumococcal disease as well. I think, you know, there's something about making sure when someone comes into contact with healthcare that they, that actually we just ask them the question about vaccination. We talked a bit about health and social care professionals, and, and perhaps at this point it's worth saying, you know, my organisation is, you know, we're, we're definitely, we try not to be just a talking shop, and we're really about delivering change. So, for example, this, the last four or five years, we've been working, um, pushing government, really, on reimbursement of vaccination for social care workers. So we had a crazy situation in the UK where actually social care workers were recommended to have the vaccination, but they weren't reimbursed. And this situation, yeah, the reality is our care home sector is a complete mess and has got no money at all. So the thought that independent care homes were about to go and vaccinate their staff, you know, the reality is they, they weren't about to. Um, and, and actually government has just announced some changes in the rules there. Um, We've, um, you know, we've actually also, you know, and the point about Zoster earlier is interesting. Year on year, we've seen slight decreases in Zoster uptake in the UK. Um, we, d we did a bit of media work because actually to complicate things, the, the guidelines in the UK are not 70 to 79. They're this crazy 70, 71, 72, 77, 78, 79. Absolutely impossible. You've got to know your date of birth in order to know where and if what in order to know whether you're mm -hmm. eligible. And if one family, if the husband is eligible because he's a certain age and the the say the husband's 71 and is eligible and the wife is 75 she isn't you know and they go in together it's just we, we you know we, we, it's a crazy recommendation but the, but again we did a bit of work that has uh, had led to a little bit of relaxation i was really pleased this morning to hear louise talk about self-declination forms so essentially getting people to sign a form to say i don't want a vaccination um because in my view actually as someone who who has
has had to, who's, uh, or when I was with my wife, when she signed herself out of hospital, it's a very scary thing to go against doctor's advice and to sign a piece of paper saying this is your responsibility is, 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 is quite daunting. Um, so actually just going to people and saying, well, okay, you don't want the vaccination, sign this piece of paper to say you don't want the vaccination. It's amazing how many people will change their mind upon fear of um, them having to take responsibility. Um, so, 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 but, but we have got to engage yourself on social care workers. There has been some brilliant, and Public Health England has done some great stuff, as indeed have some trusts around good practice in terms of uptake amongst health and social care workers. Although I do think, and the point was made earlier, that the financial incentives for trusts to vaccinate is, is over winter is clearly one of the big, big ones. Um, this was a community health trust campaign based on a popular birthday card series in the UK. Um, uh, so what else? I, I think it's really important that we should go where consumers go and the UK has pretty much led the, uh, the world, certainly Europe, in terms of pushing forward um, adult vaccination through pharmacies. I, th I think it's really important to continue that. I think Ireland have now taken it on. So you can go into your typically a supermarket and have your vaccination and the data goes back to your GP. And as a private individual, you can just go in and buy it for 10 euros. There are now more vaccina vaccinations available, increasing number of vaccinations available in the, in the private sector. For, for an older person who, um, well, it's two things. One is that Actually, there is a, you know, when we have flu outbreaks, we're often told not to go to our GPs unless we have flu. So, so actually, or if we have flu, but actually there, there is a question about whether GPs generally, places where people are sick, is the best place to go. And sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Um, but also, I think there's a question about, um, you know, uh, if, if, if I'm in my 80s and need my daughter to drop me off at, Actually, it's much easier to do that on a Saturday morning in a town centre than have to do it at half past two in the afternoon in the doctors. So, so there is a very strong case, I think, for expanding. There are challenges, but there's a strong case. I think you, we've really got to learn from, uh, and of course, Fahler just got his uh, Nobel Prize for his work in this area, how we can look to behavioural economics. Um, and again, the UK has done a great job in, in, in this area. Um, talk about declination forms. Sense of civic duty is actually a really interesting one. Uh, one of the things we do in the UK particularly well is actually we don't engage, and Public Health England, again, great on this, we try, we try not to engage with anti-vax organisations, but we just talk about the social norm. We talk about, I do that. You know, uh, we actually move the social norm to be one towards vaccination. Um, and I think it's really important that to, for us to engage employers um, in this, whether that be in relation to flu or shingles. Um, uh, I, I, th I think you were, I was talking to one healthcare, uh, one insurer, one, uh, uh, an underwriter who said to me that a flu pandemic could wipe out an insurer, and yet insurer, health insurers don't tend to automatically offer flu vaccination. Yeah, actually, there is you know a real problem with the insurance sector and occupational health. You just don't really see the value of vaccination. Um, this is actually a, a photo I was talking to. Um, I've forgotten your name from America, the uh, uh, military, uh, Haley. Earlier, I think this is a military soldier being immunised um, uh, in the US. So there are certain sectors, soldiers and airline pilots all get vaccinated, but lots of sectors don't. Um, I think it's really important to um, communicate through uh, insurance companies. I think, coming to the end, I think we've got to use new technology, and these are some of my favourites. This is, a, and I still use this, even though it's really old, a washing machine that basically you have to put your fingerprint on it, and it lets the husband do the washing, and then the wife. You can't have two people do the, 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 the washing at the set in one after each other. So it's, uh, you can wash your clothes. So if the wife does it one morning, the husband has to do it the next morning, or what, but the partners or whatever. It's brilliant. For some reason, this has never taken off. I imagine because huge piles of washing started to appear when it was the husband's time to do it. Um, but and similarly, this on the right is a bit of kit in Japan, where um, a bit of kit in Japan, where 
it sends an email to the son or daughter when they've had their um, when they've had their noodles in the morning. Really interesting. But you know, what if you don't fancy your noodles? What if uh, what if you've been out with a lady friend for the evening and don't want your family to know you've had your noodles? But but the potential that you have in the noodles, you know, really but some really interesting potential. And I know someone tomorrow is going to talk about Google flu, so I won't say anything <coughs> about this. But the potential of location-based data for us to to actually deliver services at a very local level very quickly there were there was a japanese flu company who stocked pharmacies based on um on words that were coming up in twitter so you know there is real potential for some of this um then finally, you know, guidelines are really important, but actually, so is reimbursement. I think we've got to get the right incentives in place. So you, the US, for example, um, you know, has quite good guidelines, but the reimbursement is slightly difficult. Um, UK actually probably has a good mix between guidelines and reimbursement, which is one of the reasons we have relatively good uptake. Um, uh, I, th and I think it's really important that healthcare structures support adult vaccination. So one of the challenges we've got is, uh, or the, the restructuring in the UK health might help it, is that sometimes the budgets for hospital beds aren't in the same place as the budgets for vaccination. So I was talking to one person from a hospital trust who said to me that um, he knew using big data who the 5,000 people were who were likely to get pneumococcal disease over the next two the next sort of two winters he knew exactly who they were he said his budget was for beds there was no way he could transfer his budget to a vaccination it was someone else's responsibility so so there is something about and i, I do think the uk's get is structure is slightly it, that might be much less of an issue now but i think we've got to make sure that healthcare structures don't inadvertently favor beds over prevention um and then finally we we do have a uh, an adult immunization website and I'd be really keen to have any content at all from you on it this is has been supported by 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 Pfizer but also IFA so just to give you a quick view um, we've just you know what we what this is for is for anything across Europe related to adult vaccination and we we really focus on some of the policy areas rather than necessarily the research so our first story is a piece of work we've just done with the International Federation on Aging on public health um, we're building up this database you can go to categories let's go to shingles as we just have you know under shingles we've got super drug making chicken pots available on the high street We've got uh, our work on shingles, work on shingles falling. So, so by country and issue, there's lots of data there. So at that point, mm -hmm. I'm going to stop. But thank you very much for listening. <laughs>